my father was still a bachelor. I recognized everything about him, the dark face, the sheen of his glasses, the white linen and baby shoes, the thin frame and baby trousers, everything except for the white skipper's hat he slant on his head. Next to him hanging from a rope wrapped around his tail, a giant salmon straight out of wind. He seemed to be lifting the great creature single-handedly from the base of his tail. The fish is a gleaming sword of black and silver and shook jaws leaping over my father's shoes. My father had won the salmon derby that year to photograph a taken. The contest was held every spring in a series of two or three day openings in designated areas near and around the island. Previous winners had the names of another. He was a slight brown man from the Philippines, equally determined to catch the largest, most desirous of salmon, called the Chinook, better known in Alaska as the King. Fishing for the giant amongst giants requires an immeasurable amount of patience, and while luck was out of his control, my father was a storehouse. He had been a bachelor for quite some time. Many of many hopeful young Filipino men who arrived in the U.S. between the years 1906 and 1934. Historians identify them as the second wave of Filipino immigrants to reach American shores. By the time my father arrived, community in Kawano, the Filipino term of respect the migratory men used to address each other, had already sprouted up and down America's west coast. They labored in Southern California fish fields, bus tables and restaurants, worked with Japanese immigrants by law in 1882 from further entry to the U.S. as the primary laborers in Alaska salmon towns. Mana, what province are you from? These men would have asked each other, finding safety amongst countrymen in this strange new country. How long you been in California? My newly arrived father would have asked, with a deep accent that followed him into old age as they washed the grime off their hands and faces and retreated to the worker shack for the night. Many farm laborers slept in barn-like shelters filled to capacity bunk beds lined side by side, stacked carts precariously high. They were farmhands by day, chickens in their coops by night. The next morning they rose to harvest again, with calloused hands and bent backs, tolerating the searing sun. A seasoned farmer, farmer, my father decided not to stay and call California home. Like so many others, he may have been drawn to discovering more of this new country, drawn by the stories of others. I'm left to wonder about many details of my father's life. How did he reach Seattle? Did he take a bus or hitchhike? Did he admire the wild coastlines of Northern California and Oregon en route? My father, a taciturn old man until his death, never recounted his journey to me. An inheritor of silence, I write to bridge my life to this unspoken past, fill it with stories I was never told. In the rainy, evergreen city of Seattle, he met a fellow Filipino named Joe, who I came to know as Grandpa. And he would later tell me how he had persuaded my father to join him in finding work in the salmon canneries up north in Alaska. They went by boat, entering the Straits of Juan de Fuca, awed by sharp mountains, legions of rough trees, small islands dotting the coast. The waters of their passage were smooth like gemstone, but the waves turned to angry, flapping hands when land disappeared on the port side, opening to an endless sea. A day or two later, the safety of land returned on both sides so much closer now it seemed to be they could just step under the black waters of the Tonga Channel and walk ashore. It was raining when they arrived, spring or summer, the sunshine scattered gloriously but unpredictably on the temperate river soil. Plinkets had originally set up a fish camp at Ketchikan Creek, which burst with, spa with spawning salmon in late summer. In 1936, several canneries had been built in town. The men walked down front in Mission Street, lined with supply stores, curio shops, and the ever-present saloons. Soon enough, Joe and my father were standing in a frigid cannery, layered in long sleeve shirts, wool pants, thick plastic aprons, and rubber boots. They butchered and rinsed fish just off the sailor. Joe and my father joined a community of not just mono, but white men, the Native Alaskans that my father called Injuns. Though not yet a state, Alaska had already been transformed into a few nations. During my trip to the Philippines over the years, I caught glimpses of what might have been might have resembled his early life. A young boy playing in the forest of his birthplace, schoolboys in uniform milling about his